Well, hello there from episode 106 of A. Thompson and Other Disappointments. You're usually twice weekly delve into the world of politics and uh, more often dystopia. Um, if it's your first time listening to this, uh, we are, we're out in Phuket at the moment, so you're being treated to the sounds of Phuket in the background because, as I said on the last episode, shock, spoiler, this podcast does not generate sufficient income to rent out international podcast studios. Uh, but, you know, bear with. Maybe this time next year we'll go on a fucking world tour or something. Um, and the reason that we're in Phuket, yes, look, if it's your first time listening, you might think, well, hang on a second, this guy's in Thailand talking about British politics? Yeah, I live in the UK. We're just on fucking holiday, all right? We're out here for a month in Thailand doing nothing for accusations that I'm part of some privileged metropolitan elite. Um, but you know what? Like we, we haven't had a holiday for fucking years. So g- g- go fuck yourselves a little bit. Um, on that subject, uh, on that note, we're, holiday's almost over. And it's, uh, it's probably the last episode before we return to good old Blighty. Where things just work. Things like trains and uh, airports. And track and trace apps. And prime ministers who... A photograph getting fucked up, holding a thumbs up. <laughs> well, while the country descends into a post-apocalyptic nightmare of fossil fuel scarcity and, well, I don't know, bartering, I guess, is probably where we're headed. Like, how long until the currency markets react to the spiralling depression that we're headed for? How long until that happens? Until, like, the pound sterling tanks, more so, <laughs> and then people start trading in dollars and euros, you know? As a, as a backup. Like, I don't trust that pounds are going to be worth the same tomorrow. So, yeah, if you've got dollars or euro, like, how long until that happens? Or sex work. How long before people start trading in sex work? If you can. If you have that option open to you. I don't know. You may consider it. Because the value of a blowjob is fairly steady. In that most men quite like them. And I'm not judging. You know, if you, if you do go that route, if the currency is collapsing so fast that you don't know if the wheelbarrow of notes someone's paying you to, what, like, water their crops in this post-apocalyptic Britain is still going to be worth even half the same amount the next day. You might take a cheeky bloge instead. I'm just saying. It's not all doom and gloom as we envelope into the economic abyss. There are ways of making it work for you, is all I'm saying in this fucking monsoon rainstorm recording this podcast. What does this say about my mental health that I'm out here talking to my phone in the pouring rain? <laughs> that's that's how I'm handling, that's the psychological way I'm handling the economic abyss that we're headed towards. Anyway, look, I've, I've had a nice few days. Uh, holiday's been fun. I did a blog that kind of caught fire. So yeah, that was fun. Um, it's just taking the piss out of how central heating is going to end up being the new bourgeois hit of the winter season. Like, I always worry I'm going to mispronounce that word. Is it like bourgeois? Bourgeois? Is that right? Like, I like I can write it fine, but actually saying it is a bit tricky. Bourgeois. I can write it, but I can't. Like, does that make it... Probably makes me a hypocrite in some weird fucked up way. Like, yeah, you write it, but would you ever say it? Yeah, that's what I thought. It needs an abbreviation, you know, or a anglicized version of it. You know, bourgeois, like booge or something. <laughs> Fucking hell, like booge, man. The, cr- the crushing irony of taking something as pleasant sounding as bourgeois and changing it to booge is just too much instantly becomes not bourgeois if you describe it as bouge. I like it though, you know, it's like it lands right, don't you think? You can imagine your friend saying like, oh, we went to this little uh, little independent cocktail bar in Soho on Friday night. Oh yeah? Was that any good? Oh mate, proper bouge, you know? <laughs> I think that could take off. In fact, fuck it, that's it. That's my new vibe. Binfluencers, out. It is no longer on vogue. Bouge is in. Clearly. Um, 
anyway, so yeah, that's it. We're, we're coming home from Phuket, Thailand. Uh, we've been here for a month, uh, where you will be relieved to hear, or, you know, depressed, perhaps, that there is no talk of energy bills sending people into fuel poverty here. There is no, I haven't heard it once. Though, granted, a huge chunk of the population seem to already be in poverty. But you get my point, right? Things seem to be fine here. And, um, and fine is probably the right word. You know, they're, they're fine in both the, uh, you know, the fine wines and uh, fine art sense and definition of the word. Because you have, like, beautiful beaches and unbelievable service and food and smiling and friendly people. It is, like, the finest of blue and turquoise seats. Seats? Seas! You know what I mean. I misspoke. Uh, the finest of beaches, the finest of all of these things, exist in Thailand. And then, concurrently, in the context of natural gas supplies and the cost of living, you know, the multiple myriad crises that we're facing in the UK. Then you ask a Thai person here, like, you know, how's, how's your electricity supply? Yeah, it's fine. So it's fine in that sense too. Everything is fine here. How have you been, Gary? Yeah, fine. It's like that. No one's tearing their hair out over energy bills here. And though, you know, yes, probably millions of people live in shacks and squats. That was also the case five years ago. And it's the same today. And it's sad, but at least no one's worried that they'll, you know, lose their moped or shack or indeed close their hotel or cafe when the electricity goes through the roof. Here, like, everything is just fine. How's your electric, mate? Fine. And it's quite jarring, it's quite stark then when you read the news of back home, you know? Cost of living crisis, electricity bills going through the I did a little Google earlier because I was curious as to like, you know, how, why the soaring bills in the UK weren't such a tabloid horror story for people over here, you know? And I assumed it was going to be something like, um, you know, Thailand invested smart. They get lots of sun, even in monsoon. Although, you know, today's a fucking <laughs> stark contrast to that shit. But, you know, even in monsoon, we've had about like two or three rainy days in a month here. Everything else has been just, you know, blazing sunshine. So I imagine they would be like, you know, they invested smart and now 40% of their energy comes from solar and the other 60% from wind and nuclear. Or, you know, something along those lines. I don't know. Some smart way of strategizing that Brits, we would have looked at and dismissed purely because we're so drunk on exceptionalism. Purely because we think we're better than this country or that country. And I don't mean we as in like you and me. Obviously, we're not like that. We're fucking smart, dear listeners. But, you know, the people that run the country, the people that run Britain are so fucking dumb. Not only do they trash their own experts, but they would honestly look at a place like Thailand or Malaysia or China or India and they would look at the energy solutions or the energy supplier portfolio that these countries are embracing I and mean, look at them and then they would look back at themselves and then they would look back at these countries like Thailand and then they would go well you know if they're doing that we have to do something else because we're Britain you know if that's what they're doing we'll just do something else because that's what third world countries do and we're not a third world country and we won the war, you know? Like whoever the fuck trusts energy min minister ends up being hired purely on the basis that he or she wanks over a union jack seven times a day and has been de-radicalized by Sunak and would, get, like, would go on a diplomatic jaunt here and there and they would come back and they'd be like, well, you know, obviously we have to do the total opposite of what this bloody third world country is doing. You know, and then their aide would be like, well, do we? I mean, you know, Thailand's a constitutional monarchy like us and they have universities and theatres and nuclear physicists and it seems like they've concluded that this energy mix is a good way forward for sustainability and independence and for the planet. And then this, you know, trust minister or civil servant would be like, well, yes, but, you know, this is Britain, Nigel. We do things our own way. 
And you, like, you think I'm joking, but I am positive I've read stories where people have talked about politicians who behave like that, you know, decision makers, senior figures in the civil service and indeed in the government. Like they'll reject an idea out of hand based on whether the EU have done it and then pig-headedly do the opposite. No, I don't have any examples. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't fucking news night. Anyway, look, I had, I had a little Google and it turns out Thailand do not have a pick and mix fantasy of solar and nuclear and so on. They're actually mostly oil and gas and coal, which is depressing because, you know, like I don't want to get all judgy here, but I mean, you know, you know, you're murdering my fucking planet, right? I mean, that is what you're doing. Just just so we're 100 percent clear. Like, There's no point dancing around the obvious. Like Thailand, you have been very kind to me. But that doesn't mean I have to look the other way. I've had way too many heroes disappoint me to put absolute blind faith in anything by this stage in life. I'm 41. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to look the other way while you ejaculate carbon into the atmosphere and doom my fucking descendants to living underground for 900 years because they're waiting for your fucking moped and tuk-tuk clouds to clear. Like, yes, you're a friendly, smiley bunch, but no... Still not cool. You know? It is weird, though, like, because Thailand is so nice, so perfect, so friendly. And yet, then there's that fucking nonsense. Oil, coal, gas. Kill the planet. It's like going to an amazing restaurant where the service is fantastic, friendly, overly friendly. (laughs) It borders consent, to be frank with you. (laughs) The service out here. Though, you know, consent, like renewable energy, perhaps also an area of development uh, for Thailand. Um, but let's, <laughs> let's not go into that. Anyway, you're in this restaurant. Let me finish this metaphor, this clumsy as fuck metaphor. You're in a restaurant, amazing service, super friendly, food is reasonably priced and the decor, perfect. Booge even. Every, everything is perfect, except you took a shit in my soup. You know, that is kind of, that's kind of Thailand. Friendly, perfect, cheap, but ruining life on Earth. So, anyways, Googling this shit. And here's the reason why people aren't tearing their hair out about energy prices. It's because energy costs seven baht per kilowatt hour. Right, that's 17 pence. And in the UK, it's about to be 51 pence. So it's three times as expensive in the UK. (laughs) And these guys are the ones living in huts. Like, how the fuck have we got here? No wonder they think we're minted everywhere. Like, when I'm walking down the beach promenade here, they're like, you know, you can't buy one fucking bracelet and fake hair braid for your girlfriend. Like, I read The Guardian. I know what you pay to run your PlayStation. You rich fucking asshole. Buy the braided hair thing. Buy the fridge magnet. You can't buy one of these, really? Like, So, yeah, it is a third of the price here and mostly fueled by natural gas. And it gets that gas from Myanmar, I found out. And then I started thinking, right? Like, can we just get our gas from there? You know, it seems like we're short on it. Can we just get our gas from Myanmar? And I'm just, I'm just gonna let that silence hang there and let the stupidity just you know, ferment in your ear holes for a second. <laughs> this is honestly, honestly what I was thinking. I was like, what if we just bought gas from Myanmar, guys? I solved the puzzle. <laughs> because, look, I'm not a foreign policy expert. I know some things about Britain's political and, you know, parliamentary system. And I know a little bit about America, too. But I don't know the ins and outs of every fucking military occupation standoff coup shit going on everywhere. Like, all I knew was the bare bones, you know, and that lady's face I'd seen on on the TV a few times. And I know that we're seemingly running low and desperate for natural gas. These guys apparently have some, and Thailand aren't going without, or even seeing a price rise, so... <laughs> I was a bit like, have I... Have I just solved the cost-of-living crisis? Oh, my God! I mean, I... <laughs> 
I knew I was special, but... Uh... But then I started looking at Myanmar while I was Googling. It was one of those mornings, you know, like the kids are asleep, you start Googling one thing and you go down a rabbit hole, just levels deep, you know. And it turns out Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, if you're not aware, turns out the reason we don't buy from them is because they're sanctioned to fuck. You know, a loose, barely sourced bit of research tells me that this relates to, uh, I think it was a UN fact-finding mission that found a bunch of human rights abuses. And so the UK joined the US and Canada and... Look, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't look into it that deeply, but, you know, partly because I kind of, I know the story anyway. You know, you know when you just know? Like, it'll be something along the lines of there was a military coup and they, what, you know, overthrew a democratic leader, I think, was it? And now it's an authoritarian government with human rights abuses. Like, is that about right? Is that why we're not buying gas from them? Tweet me if I've got that wrong. <laughs> like, if... If I've got that wrong, like if if there's some uncertainty to my cavalier, clumsy non-research and my conclusion based on total ignorance of that country and completely abandoning looking into it, I'm going to fuck around and get hired by the foreign office or some shit here if I keep keep at this. But here's the thing, right? This is what this is what fucks people off is because we we say shit like authoritarian government with a litany of human rights abuses and persecuting people using public execution. Like, which sounds bad, I know. But we still do business with other countries that do that stuff, that exact stuff. So it's like, well, you're obviously talking horseshit. (laughs) So what's the problem? What is the exact problem? What's the actual issue here? that's stopping you from doing business with Myanmar when we're desperate for what they, I assume, would sell us. And you imagine having that conversation with somebody in a position of power and influence, and they'd be like, well, I've just told you, you know, they don't don't run their country in a fair and democratic way. They're savages. They don't have the same values as us, aid. They're just different. You're like, well, like how? Well, you know, with, uh, with regards to women and uh, equality and gay rights and uh, capital punishment and... Right, but, I mean, what about Saudi Arabia? I, um, well... I... Well, the Saudis are a strategic partner and, uh, you know, you can't necessarily force your views on other countries. So, like, it is that obviously hypocritical and ridiculous. It's like, oh, they're a strategic partner. Oh, well... Is energy supply not a strategic matter? It feels pretty fucking strategic to me. I mean, let's put it plainly. What what economic and social strategy are we following where we revert back to the Middle Ages, you tap-dancing tossers? You know, like, strategy-wise, how are we going to power Britain? That's quite a fundamental question for strategy. For strategic partnering, I think. And it sounds like I'm taking the piss with this, right? But honestly, there is a video of Liz Truss, our incoming Prime Minister, being grilled by the Labour MP Chris Bryant. And it's from earlier this year, I think. And it is almost that exact exchange. You know, like, how do you explain our relationship with Saudi Arabia if you're so against countries who publicly execute other people? You dappy bint. You know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing slightly there. But it's like, you know, you're against this type of ruler and this type of governing, this punishment and this persecution. Yes, except you're not. No, not really. <laughs> and so then, like, as I'm Googling this, remember, you know, I'm, I start going levels deep. I don't know if this is like an ADHD thing or even if I have ADHD, people have told me you probably do, Aid. Um, or if I'm just in some, you know, maniacal phase, having some sort of bipolar fit, or I don't know. Or, or maybe it's just the right reaction to seeing that electricity may soon be unavailable to me. So quick, Google it while we still got power, while I'm still in a country that doesn't suffer from blackouts. But I start going level steep. I'm starting like, okay, well, if we accept that Saudi Arabia is pretty fucking barbaric, like they could publicly behead you for atheism, or being gay, or whatever, you know? 
They don't seem to fuck about or engage in any PR with this. They're like, yep, this is what we do. This is how we are. If we accept that there's some values we don't 100% share with them, then what is the actual problem with Myanmar? What is Myanmar doing that we find so abhorrent that's worse than publicly beheading gay people? Where we're like, all right, you know, I, I felt uneasy with stoning people in the street in the street for fornication. But this, well, this is too much. What Myanmar are doing is too much. Like, what is that? Where is that line? And the answer to that is the government that we engaged with before, which was led by a lady called uh, Ong San Suu Kyi. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm probably not. She was overthrown in a military coup. And then the new guys come in, I think. As I say, I haven't looked into this too deeply. <laughs> Not substantially, just just levels deep. Right? Like, I know that sounds paradoxical, right? But you know what I mean, right? I've gone delving to see superficially what's happened. And that's taken me to the next juncture or the next warped conclusion. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this is all 100% accurate. I think it's mostly accurate, you know, mostly. But as always, happy to be corrected. Sometimes I think when I do this podcast, should I do a disclaimer at the beginning to stop getting sued or stop, stop getting lambasted and spreading fake news or misinformation? Should I just do, put a disclaimer at the beginning, like just before, like beauties and influencers and, you know, those looking for a proper booge podcast or whatever? Should I then say this podcast is purely entertainment? It should not be taken as any sort of news feed. If you're if you're reading this as news or listening to this as news, that is a damning indictment of where we're at with new media in the 21st century. And the sooner the power cuts come, the fucking better. Um, anyway, for now, let's, let's continue. I think it's mostly accurate. Anyway, yeah, so it turns out that the democratically elected government that we liked, that we, the West, liked, they were overthrown and a military constitution was set up giving this new government emergency powers because they said there was voter fraud <laughs> and the previous election wasn't valid. It was illegitimate. Any of that sound familiar, by the way? I mean, I think it's basically what January the 6th was supposed to do. Storm the capital, take control, say the election was fake, jail the opposition, probably. And although this lady, Ong San Suu Kyi, was sort of celebrated as a Nelson Mandela type figure, having been under house arrest for decades before, she came out and, and uh, like she won a Nobel Prize or some shit. And then she formed this government and it was supposedly democracy implemented. And, and then she gets overthrown. And that makes us sad in the West. And we create these sanctions. It makes us sad until she gets prosecuted at The Hague for fucking genocide. Shit is wild. <laughs> Ethnic cleansing. Nobel Prize winner hauled in front of The Hague because she presided, allegedly, over the 27... Allegedly, because I haven't got the disclaimer on yet, right? Uh, presiding over the 2017 campaign to raise whole villages of Rohingya Muslims to the ground. There was rape and there was murder. Shit's getting dark now, I know. I'm trying to keep it light. Um, men, women, children, infants, just a fucking bloodbath. And huge swathes of Muslims fleeing to Bangladesh, apparently. This is all from an article I read in The Independent, by the way. You can Google um, Aung, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi ignoring unspeakable crimes against Rohingya Muslims caught at The Hague. Here's it's by Tim Wyatt. Um, so I read this and then I start thinking, OK, well, Aung San's bad now, right? Cool. <laughs> Yesterday she was Nelson Mandela. Today she's Saddam Hussein. Fine. You know, hell of a rebrand. But like I said... I've had too many heroes disappoint me <laughs> by this stage in life. Why should this bitch be any different, you know? Like, Louis C.K. was a progressive intellectual feminist who turned out to be shoving women in bathrooms and jerking off in front of his direct reports in his office. So am I going to be that shocked that a Nobel laureate has turned out to be a monster? Not really, to be honest. Lost had a better twist. Anyway, so according to these lawyers at The Hague, getting quite ranty now. Sorry, guys. Let me have a quick sip of coffee. Hold on. So according to the lawyers at The Hague, 
Best case scenario is that she turned a blind eye while it all went on. And worst case, she was the evil mastermind, you know, coordinating this shit. But then, like, doesn't that get you thinking, right? So she's a Nobel Prize winner, friend of the West, lauded as this sort of Nelson Mandela figure. And now she's the bad guy who supposedly conducted uh, mass genocide. And it gets you thinking, so she's the bad guy now. Can we just accept that whoever overthrew her is all right and buy the fucking gas? <laughs> Can we just do that? Why is there still a cost of living crisis when we agree that the people who overthrew her are probably OK and did it for the right reasons? Or have we not reached that conclusion yet? I'm, I'm confused here. And you start wondering, here's, like, here's where it gets really funky. Then you start thinking, well, hang on. Is this just what I'm supposed to think? You know, am I being gamed here? Not to get too tinfoil hat with you, listeners. But am I just being railroaded by media and its close proximity to government and geopolitics? Am I being railroaded into being fine with doing dirty trade deals? with murderous, gay-killing, atheist-beheading nations. You know, like, like, is it a sham trial that's only there to sort of ferment this idea that she's a bad guy and now the, the people who are actually in charge of the oil and the gas and whatever else they produce in Myanmar, Myanmar are actually OK? Do you know what I mean? It's all there, designed. And, you know, this poor lady will be jailed for whatever. But the decision makers in the US and the UK, it's a, it's a fucking good day for them. And you read this shit in The Independent, and then that gets you thinking, oh, well, the new guys aren't so bad then. So, yes, yeah, fine to sign contracts with them. And then you, me, everyone who read a headline like, Myanmar lady jailed for psycho murder spree, we are all fine. When the next item on the news is like, and the West cut a red ribbon today and proudly said, Texaco, BP, Shell, in you go, boys, do your thing, you know, in a hundred billion dollar deal, bringing jobs and stability to the region, you know, then we, we applaud that. We're like, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Stability, jobs. Let's let's bring those people up with their living standards. And and also let's get some cheap electric. Do you know what I mean? Like, am I just following the script here? Am I being conditioned? Like, how dark are the arts of geopolitics? Is what I was thinking as I was researching, tired, exhausted, delirious at 5 a.m. this morning. Because I know everyone said Iraq was about oil. And again, look, I don't want to get too tinfoily with you guys. I live on planet Earth. I'm not into conspiracy theories generally. But you know how everyone said Iraq was about oil and Afghanistan was about actually creating a pipe to root oil out to the international marketplace? If you don't know about that, you should read about Dick Cheney and his previous position. Before he went into government with the Republicans, he worked, he worked for a big fucking oil company. And then he ran Halliburton or some shit, didn't he? He's, he's got a very checkered past. I know everyone celebrates his daughter currently as some sort of neoliberal common sense articulator in the January the 6th hearings, but her father, warmonger, oil magnate, uh, largely seen as the evil mastermind behind George Bush's presidency and going into Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, anyway, look, let's, let's try and stay on point here. Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and both of those were sold to us under the pretext of terror and a dictator who used chemical weapons on his own people, which look, he may have done, and that's not okay. That is comfortably taboo. But my point is, so do a lot of people. So what's different about these guys, these countries? And the answer to that is invariably fossil fuels. And then the next question is, that, that links onto that, is like, if that's the case, then why not do a deal with Myanmar? as we're careering uncontrollably into this cost of living crisis. But we're so able to turn a blind eye when it's Saudi Arabia or whatever. And like, is, is the reason that we're able to turn a blind eye to Saudi Arabia 
is because here's a wild thought, right? Here's a new theory. It's because their values are actually not that different. <laughs> like, like they say we don't share the same values as country X or country Y. But then you look at these countries crushing their oppositions, jailing journalists, criminalizing protest. And then you look back at Tory Britain. <laughs> Yeah, they don't. Uh, they don't share our values. We're like, are you? Uh, are you sure? Because <laughs> you know? it. It seems like you guys actually have quite a bit in common. <laughs> like, I wonder if. Uh, I wonder if under different stars, in different circumstances, you motherfuckers might not actually really hit it off. <laughs> we don't. They don't share our values. They kind of do, actually. And maybe. <laughs> maybe here's an awkward question maybe a lot of Britons might actually be okay with you doing a trade deal with a murderous dictator if you get their fucking heating on that is a you know like would you accept Liz Truss and Dominic Raab shaking hands with some bloodied medal wearing military looking motherfucker still with blood splat on his face from having sat through a private lap dance booth execution with an, of an adulterer. <laughs> Would you accept that if it kept your EDF bill the same as Thailand's? Like, where is that line for you? <laughs> now we're getting interesting. It only took fucking, I don't know what we're at, 35 minutes in now. It only took half an hour to get to something intellectually stimulating. But let's play with this idea a bit. Where is that line for you? With your, your PS5 and your iPhone charger and your three plasma TVs all drinking in energy and Netflix content. And it all shuts off. What would you accept in terms of a trade deal to get you back to normal? For me? I don't know. I think... I mean, my faith is, is, like, on the floor with Great Britain, generally. I think, like, we live in a country so laughably high and mighty, so drunk on exceptionalism. Like, we parade ourselves on the world stage like this strutting peacock. We're like a granddad waving war medals at the care home dinner. And the other residents don't give a shit. They're passed out or they've gone batty, you know, just sitting there singing songs from their childhood. <laughs> Nothing else. You ask them, like, what their name is or, you know, what they want for dinner. Nothing. Just emotionless catatonia. Singing songs from their childhood, no problem. Or they're literally dead, sat in an armchair. Just a corpse in an armchair. And the staff aren't even looking. They're paid minimum wage. They're just sat staring at their phones, swiping left and right on some fuck me app and accepting jobs on Uber for their lunch break. And, and this sad, pathetic twat in his getup with his medals is just sat there like, we, we won the bloody war. Like, like nobody cares. Nobody. Ca I know that sounds brutal, but it is true. That is who Britain is. But there's wars that have started and finished in the last 20 years. <laughs> That if, they, if somebody talked about it in a British Legion or a Conservative club, the patrons would tell them to shut the fuck up. It was ages ago. Oh, that war. Oh, it was 17 years ago. Why don't you shut the fuck up about it? We're talking about the weather, for God's sake. So just know that on the world stage, when they see people like Fabrican or like Francois, what was it he said? Well, my, my grandfather didn't surrender to any Germans and neither, neither will I, you know. Just know that they eye roll so hard they can actually see their own brain. Like when foreign diplomats deal with Tories, they gouge their own eyes out and stuff them in their ears to block out the nonsense. I'm positive. Fly home with, without eyeballs. <laughs> Think they've been, like the president of that country go, oh, how was the UK? What did you get done? Oh, fucking hell, did they torture you or some shit? But we live in Britain, right? Where, where in most towns, you could walk seven or eight minutes, and in that time, you would find some St. George Cross tattoo bellend who would tell you he's proud of his country. We won the war. We beat Hitler, which was presumably a little bit about democracy and freedom and stopping persecution and our values. And yet the same person in 2022 would absolutely sell the people of country X 
down the river to keep their fucking PS5 running. Guaranteed. Like, they wouldn't even consider the question. <laughs> you would say to them, like, a million people will die if you press that power. Oh, you, you pressed it already! Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, I want to play GTA, bro. What the fuck? It's so darkly funny how bad shit has gotten, how quickly. You know, cost of living in the UK, electricity shortages and blackouts and rationing being talked about. Like, how weird is it? Like, when you think back to the 80s, <laughs> I'm showing my age now, but like, you know, I said I'm 40, 41. Remember back in the 80s when Back to the Future 2 came out and it was all flying cars and self-tying laces and hologram billboards and and now that, like, that was supposed to be 2015, right? Now it's 2022. We're after that. And the height of our technological futurism is can I put the fucking freezer on? <laughs> is, is like your friend coming around and then going like, yeah, do you, do you mind, um, like, like, is it okay if I flush your piss away before I take a shit? Is that, do you mind? <laughs> From flying cars to this regressive awfulness to medieval life. It's very Binfluencer. Booge, it is not. Uh, guys, this has, as ever, been fun, or at least uh, has put the, uh, the fun into fundamentally depressing uh if you enjoy these shows in some weird warped way um and indeed the guested ones where i ask people questions um uh, as a prelude to answering them myself and ranting at confused guests for an hour uh please do consider jumping on the patreon and supporting both this and the sunday blogs and political tiktoks that i put together there's three tiers that you can sign up for if you go to patreon and search aid thompson you will find me or you can google uh, i think you have to google like the full patreon aid thompson podcast Otherwise, you end up with loads of other weird shit. Um, so if you Google Patreon Aid Thompson podcast, uh, or you can find the link. Uh, there's, I always put a Patreon link on every episode you click on on funk27.co.uk. That is my website where I put everything. funk-27.co.uk. Um, all episodes and blogs and everything go up there two days after they've gone out to Patreon. So Patreons always get everything first. Um, there's a nice cheapy option on there, by the way. There's a £3 a month thing, which is just enough to buy me a beer, really, and say cheers for the content. Uh, or there's a fiver a month, which makes you a fully signed up member of my cult. And it is a cult. In this economy, with this ferociously dire outlook, I want full loyalty. So a cult it is. Uh, and then there's a third tier. You have to do three tiers on Patreon. And the third tier is a tenner a month, which is obviously, you know, fuck that. No one needs to pay that. Um, but yet, you know, as I say, three tiers. So uh, three quid just buys me a beer. Five quid, you join the cult. You take your pick. Uh, the Binfluencer Cult, by the way, has its first meetup on Thursday the 27th of October in London. So if you get on it quickly, you can come along to that. Um, the venue is still to be confirmed. I'm going to thrash that out next week when we're back in the UK, um, but clearly in London and likely to have some former guests of the podcast coming along too. So that is very exciting. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to meeting everyone as well. Um, speaking of which, let's say a quick thank you to all of the supporters. Uh, Alex, Chris D, Chris P, Rax, Ricardo, uh, Silent. Some of these names may not be their real names uh i you know let's just get that out there uh, silent uh, t-rex uh, oliver sarah paul and kerry um that's it thank you so much to you guys you rock my world i keep saying this on every episode but honestly your support makes all of this shit worthwhile and uh i get really psyched about posting it onto the patreon first and and engaging with you and building god i was about to say building this community but it does it does feel like a community it does feel like a nice little club um, so, yeah, so if you listen to these episodes and you're enjoying them, maybe consider the Patreon. If you're not in a position to support the podcast uh, with, you know, a little three quid doff of the cap a month to me, um, totally understand. You know, I've just spent an hour or however long this has been ranting about the cost of living and energy prices. All I would ask is that if you are listening to them and you've enjoyed two or three of them, maybe share me about. Just click the little upwards arrow. It's usually an upwards arrow for share, I think. Copy the link pop into WhatsApp and send it to a friend. And that helps the podcast to grow. 
Um, and to be honest, that's as good as a little three pound a month or five pound a month. Just help it to grow. And hopefully at some point it will generate enough income that I can quit my job. That's really, that's really what I'm looking to do. Just jack in the day job and do this and continue to build it and uh, and invite you guys to events and, and, and so on. So thank you so much once again to the Patreons. Uh, I will be back in the UK on Friday. So I think it's probably a bit quick for me to do a guest thing on Friday night, but I'll try to do a, a solo show and I'll catch up with you all then. Thanks once again. Keep it strictly hashtag Bimfluencer. Keep it strictly hashtag Tories fuck livestock. And of course, the new one, hashtag proper booge.